Alrighty, everybody. Well, happy February 13th, Valentine's Day, President's Day's coming, Lincoln's birthday was yesterday. Some of y'all, it's here about 5.30, 6 o'clock. Some of y'all are watching the Super Bowl. Some of you are watching the Puppy Bowl. Some of y'all are studying. And several of y'all have done a very nice job of getting me in the homework. I've looked at those that have been submitted. They look fine. As I say, I think about four or so have gotten them into me. So try and get those into me uh, over the next day or so where I can get, record, get them recorded, graded, and all that. Of course, here we're finishing up Chapter 2. We kind of talked about we'd do a test on Chapters 1 and 2. And then we'll have three and four, and then eventually the final and all that. So I'll be working this week also on um, coming up with a study guide for the test. As I say, this test, I'll uh, probably get it out to you another week, and you'll have a day or so to uh, do it, and we'll worry about those when we get to it. But the last four sections here, chapter two, Talk about linked list and kind of compare them, contrast them with um, the idea of an array. And they're similar. An array, remember, you go from each element, but you can go to each element instantly. If you wanted to go to element 200, well, you just say go to 200 as such. On a linked list, if you want to go to element 200, you got to go through 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth, and uh, but they have dis they have advantages and disadvantages uh, type of deals. But their primary data structures they can be combined to even more advanced structures. And so, as it talks about, an array is a solid block of data limited to the maximum number of elements. And of course, that's one thing about an array is you have to know normally how many elements you're going to have, and that's it. On the other hand, you have with a linked list, every element is a separate uh, chunk of memory. And one thing about uh, linked list is Java allows you to have some built-in manipulations, limited linked lists, things like that as a class. It uh, adjusts the sizes needed. Uh, when you free up space, the garbage collector uh, reduces them. And the book talks about a couple of other languages, Lisp and Scheme. I've done a little bit in Lisp for Lisp processing, artificial intelligence type of deal. Uh, I've never looked at Scheme, but as I say, traditionally in so many of your languages, back when I took... Um, Data structures originally in 1981 over at Tech, excuse me, we implemented them in a language called PL1, and then Pascal became popular. But in those languages, you had to actually deal with memory allocations, pointers, all of those things. And here, probably what we would have is a hundred line of code, lines of code there on implementing a stacked linked list, things like that, I'm sure I would have written five, six, seven hundred lines of code. So just remember those things as a linked list are easier to implement. You can add an element at any point to the front. It just takes a few steps. As I say, if you wanted to add something to the front of an array, then you've got to copy everything. You know, one becomes two, two becomes three, but you got to work that all the way from the back type of deal. So, you know, there's some more processing you have to do. And you got to move the things that say not very efficient. But here in Java, it talks about the LL node class, which holds the data, string, integer, etc. Plus, it has it under this LL node class, and this is what's unique, allows it to hold the link to the next node. And so objects reference the node class object. You'll say it's called a self-referential class type of deal. It uses the generic T, you know, uh, greater than, capital T, lower, uh, less than. 
on page 113, they talk there just a little bit about this public class, LL node, sub T, protected T info type of deal. Let's say info is the name of our, uh, what holds the data. And then I say the link holds the link to the next node. And when the list ends, when the last node has a null as its link. So, as I say, it's got a lot of built-in, going to save you a lot of code type of deal. You have on the top of 114, just where it has two nodes, S1 and S2, where it holds those in there, S node 1, S node 2. So, it's real simple in the way it works. It just sets it to the string. Down at the bottom, you have basketball and baseball. And so it has a real simple structure there to move between the two of them. And so just kind of be aware of those little coding conventions. And you can certainly read those. But you have operations. Now, it talks about traversal, add node, and remove node. And traversal is where you go from the first to the second to the third to the fourth, or you work your way down from the top to the second to the third till it finally reaches one, which is at the bottom, where you find a null link. And so it talks about a variable called cur, C-U-R-N-O-D-E, which points to where you are, the current node. And every time you invoke the traversal, you get the address of the current of the next node until current node equals null. So it also has a LL node substring as the variable and a Java keeps up with this position of the first node. Um, so you set LL node to current node is there. Then it goes and every time it just forms a loop, and every time it's saying current node equals current node period get link parentheses. So it's just going through in a loop, C U R R N O D E equals C U R R N O D E dot get link. It grabs the link from the one it's on, puts it into the one there it's going to, and it goes through until that. Now, remember in this application, of a stack using a linked list, you're only going down the stack. You don't have a way to go back up in both directions as if it was a queue or otherwise. So remember, if you wanted to add, have this as a little bit different than a stack, but as a flat memory structure, then you would have to have as a part of each location, each node, you would have to have the address of the node that preceded it, the information, and then the node that follows it. And so, as I say, you would have to, that takes some more programming, but we're not going to do that uh, type of deal. It talks there on the bottom of 118 and 119 about checking for empty, empty list uh, type of deal, and you have those things on uh, traversing, as I say, it just goes through until finally it um, comes to a null link type of deal. So it's showing outputs and all of those things. Now, normally what you're going to do is you're traversing this link, this linked list, this stack, is you're going to have to check for a empty list. So you look as we get a little bit further into the code, then they're either using a if statement or they're using a do while. Remember the difference between when a do while is checked and when a do until is checked. A do while is checked at the top. A do until, which you don't see very much, is checked at the bottom. So then it talks about insertion. <clears throat> and as I say, remember you can insert in the beginning, middle, or end, 
In our case, with stacks, remember, we're always inserting on the top. We're always putting something on the top, which pushes everything else down. You certainly could, in some cases later on, insert a new node into the middle of a list or into the end of it, but we aren't going into those. So it talks about how new node equals set link of letters and letters equal new node. And so it's just saying where that, if you're inserting into the beginning of a list, remember you have to set your pointer of your, neck, of your new element, your new top as such, to the address that previously was called top and then whatever, and then once you've done that, then you set your new top to the address of the node you've just created. So you've just got to go through, as I say, set things up, order of operation. It talks very much of that on uh, 120, of remembering to set your link in this new top node to the address of the previous top or top of the second element now, then once you've done that address, then you can say, like here it says, letters equals new node, and new node's address is where your letters or what they're calling here your top is. So if you don't do that right, then you lose the link to the rest of the list, and you can wind up with a um, <coughs> infinite loop to itself. And so they talk a little bit about how it works fine just checking. Remember, we talked about desk checking. You know, always make sure that before you even write your code that, yes, you have your logic correctly. And it talks a little bit about deletions where you've got three different possibilities, deleting the beginning node, deleting a node in the middle or interior, or deleting the ending node. And those are going to be covered later in the later in the book. So we're not going to worry about those right now. All we're going to worry about right now as we get here in the 2.8 and 2.9 is implementing a linked list for a stack where we're pushing items onto the stack, we're popping items off or we're looking at the top item which is the top uh, command. So you have those things. They get here in the 2.8 about where they're talking about implementation of a link stack, which implements the stack interface. So they talk about there being an instance variable which holds the link or address to the top of the stack. And as I say, then a node holds a reference to the next node and so on and so forth. And it keeps going until it gets to that address or that reference as null. And when you create an empty stack, then it sets that uh, address on the top to null. So you have here on page 122, it talks here about the link class, and it goes 122 on f throughout here for several pages, just points of it here, points of it there with some text in between. But basically, that uses the linked interface to implement a uh, group of elements. So it sets up using the package CHO2 stacks. It imports the idea of support for LL node. As I say, with that's where it calls in everything for dealing with a linked list, this LL node. And as I say, that is very unique to Java. Very few other languages do it. Then it implements the stack interface. It has LL node subtop, returns the reference, the address of the stack. And then down here on the bottom of 122, it says top is equal to null. So it's setting our stack up to be an empty stack. So then you have a couple of pages here on naming conventions and why they did that. I don't know, but you get over here on 124 and you see the push operation there that says pushes the element onto the stack. And so they say LL node sub T, and you got to skip down a little bit before it gets to it actually to the uh, um, 
code actually is on 126. So you get the push operation after it kind of explains it, but the main code is on 126 type of deal where it says top equals new node. And so just be aware of, it takes you through a little bit of how it works type of deal here on 124, 126 describes pushing values A, pushing values B and C onto it and then it actually takes us on to after we put shown playing computer pushing A, B and C reminding to have the links go from the bottom element to the top back and forth there till you finally see, as I say, there in the middle of uh, 126, you see push the element. And so it says LL node sub T, e new node equals new sub element. And then you can see no, new node dot set dot link top. And then top is equal to new node. So it does all of those things. Then it gets on over where it talks a little bit about here on 125, 126 of, well, if we have a, uh, if it's empty, then it gets ready to add the first element, second elements, things like that. And so we get to those. So that's pretty straightforward. I'd say just a little bit of code there on 126 that's a part of uh, creating and pushing things down would be a part of a loop in general or an input you'll see in a few minutes. Then we get over to 127, 128, where it pops. First thing it does is, as I say, remember, you can have an empty stack. So if you have an empty stack where, you know, the stack is null, so if it is empty there on 129, if it's empty, then it flows and it, then it throws an overflow exception. Otherwise, it says top is equal to top of get link. So it takes the value from get link and then puts it in there. So it sets the top or stack pointer to the address of the next element as it popped it off. So you have those types of things. As I say if it attempts, it also has a program here uh, on top to return a value. So it throws an exception as it gets into it. And so just kind of, you know, follow along and you should be familiar with um, how it was handled. As I say, if you return the top is empty, it talks a little bit about that on top of 131, returns true. Um, if it's full, and uh, so it looks, see whether it's true or false. So just, just remember, you've always got to allow in working with stacks for it to be empty. We'll talk in a couple of minutes about the idea of a stack maybe being, oops, did it stop? Okay, I think it's just catching up with itself. So, as I say, a little simpler uh, type of deal where it returns if it's true or if it's false. So, we'll not worry about that. As I say, looks returns false because a stack can never be full if you're trying to push things onto it. And so it gets a little bit here onto which is better, arrays or stacks. As I say, it's an arrays. Normally, you have to have your maximum number, must know your largest number of elements with a stack. Um, you don't ever run out of room, um, but you do have in a stack where it uses a little bit of uh, extra memory per element for the link. And they put here a little bit on 123, and I'm not going to dwell on it, just some good conventions on programming about uh, classes and interfaces begin with a capital letter, methods and variables begin with lowercase, and if they contain more than one word, capitalize each additional words and constants are all caps. 
and if something's an interface, have interface a part of the name. And so certainly learning about way that you can handle conventions, naming, and all of that, particularly in a program like Java, where that you have um, all the classes and how that you're inheriting from a library. You don't start off from scratch everywhere. But basically, if you just will remember here out of this first group, how to 2.8, how that when you push something on there, it updates a pointer from the lower to the one you just pushed, and your top address always is to the element that you have just pushed on there. And when you pop, it changes the pointer down to the element that was pointed to from the top element to the next element. And as you're working your way through with pushing and popping, remember you got to allow for either a full stack, which should never happen uh, on, a, on a computer these days. And the pop, you have to remember, you can be at the bottom of your stack. So before you try and remove something, either with pop or even top, where that you try and make sure you're not accessing an empty stack. So they do a fair, a very, very good example of here in 2.9 a postfix. And understanding postfix, infix, and prefix type of expressions is very important, especially if you're going to get into any type of uh, compiler design, things like that. Remember, most all of us, when we first started, our, our first calculators and all that, remember our infix, where you say 2 plus 3 times 9, and you hit enter, and you get 29. So what did it do? Remember, your good old order of operations. So it took 3 times 9 was 27 and added 2 to it. And remember, if you wanted to say, well, I really want to do 2 plus 3 and then multiply by 9, you got to put 2 plus 3 in parentheses. So then you get 5 times 9 is 45. And really dealing with infix is uh, not as efficient. It's all left to right. Remember, it does exponentiation first, then multiplication, division, and then finally addition and subtraction. And all of those were done uh, left to right. Well, as I say, there are also postfix and prefix. And postfix is where it uses that for an illustration here on a stack. And so they go through a little bit talking about postfix and where it came from. So you would enter like 5, 3 plus, or, you know, 6, 2, slash. So it would take that 5 plus. So there's the 6 and the 2. It divide them, get 3, and add 5 to it. So you get 8. So it goes through some areas there. And way back when, when I thought of postfix, it was also called RPN, Reverse Polish Notation. Now, I thought way back, you know, in the 70s and 80s when I first encountered it that they were making fun of the people from Poland. And there used to be, unfortunately, jokes about that, good and bad. Thank goodness we've moved away from a lot of those things. But it turns out, and there is a little footnote there on the very bottom of page 132, and it says that it actually the person who developed the idea of postfix was a Polish logistician <coughs> by the name of Jan Lukaswicz, and he lived from 1875 to 1956. Now, I don't know if any of y'all will ever take the compiler construction course. We offer it occasionally. And um, actually back when we when I was looking last couple lectures ago, there at the um, Turing Award winners, Turing Award, 
there was one set of authors who had won the award and they were famous for the compiler construction book that used to be the standard and it had a green dragon on the front of it. In fact, that's the one I remember. In fact, Dr. Watson and I were talking a, few, a week ago about it and he reached over on his bookshelf where I did and there was a green dragon compiler book. But one thing that compilers have to do is normally if you've entered an expression, you know, five plus three, then the compiler as a part of its far phasing of the uh, expression has to convert it into postfix five, three plus. So it's used in a lot of things used by compilers to create a non-ambiguous expression. And as I say, my first experience was there in the 70s when Hewlett Packard came out with the HP 41 series calculators and they had the one for scientific, they had another one for uh, financial analysis and you certainly knew if you had made it to engineering that you had, you had an HP 41C you could actually program these things and look it up, go out and do a search. They had these little strips that actually had the commands on them of various programs. And in the audio business, which I'm in, as you know, there have been all types of programs built. I have a, uh, I'm a member of a audio listserv called Synodcon, Synergistic Audio Concepts. And so you will see that I have posted right here on Moodle, right underneath the, uh, uh, lecture here, a couple of page article which talks about using an HP 41 to be able to use it for uh, postfix RPN uh, type of deal and how more advanced it is. And it talks about how here on the using the HP 41C that um, if you were having to do, if you were doing it by reverse Polish notation, you'd only press six keys to do something. If you were doing it on a conventional calculator, then it says nine keys are used. And they have some other examples here and all of those types, a couple of things. So about a page and a quarter article gives you a little bit of background. But I mean, the HP 41C, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. He's a retired physicist for the Navy Department, for the Department of Defense, worked for the Navy. Has designed his own doctoral program, University of Virginia. But he told me, he said, Claiborne, the space shuttle, the astronauts all carried HP 41Cs using reverse Polish notation or postfix as a backup for if the main computer on the shuttle went down. So as I say, you have those type of deals as say there's also prefix, but we're not going to get into prefix. And that's where the operators come before, so we'd be plus five three, but we're not going there. And but it would be another example of using stacks. So after you have here a little bit of a thing about how that reverse Polish or postfix are implemented. You get here on to page 134 where they talk about the operation. And they're saying if we have a string of values, characters, if it's a operand, a number, then it's pushed onto the stack. If it's another operand, it's pushed onto the stack. And then it goes through, and the next thing it says, well, if it's an operator, then remove the first two elements, perform the operation, and put the result back onto the stack. So it keeps going until it reaches the end of the data, end of file, whatever you want to call it. So they go through this whole example of we've got 5, 7, plus 6, 2, minus asterisk. They're on 135. So notice it pushes the 5, pushes the 7, just keeps going through our string of inputs, pushing them down. 
then it comes across a plus. Well, when it encounters the plus, then it goes through pops, the seven and the five off of the stack, adds them together, you get 12, and then so it pushes the 12 down onto the stack. So then it's going along, it gets to the fourth element, which is a six. That's good. Keeps on going till it gets a two. Okay, that's fine. Pushes a two. So you got 12, 6, 2 on the stack. Then it finds a minus sign. Okay, it says that's legal. So subtract two from six. It gets four. It pushes the four on top of the 12. Then it ends up on the bottom of 135 with an asterisk. So it multiplies four times 12. And it comes up with a 48 and pushes the 48 onto the stack. And so then it hits the end of the file, end of the line, input, so then it pops the 48 as a result. Now it talks a little bit about uh, illegal symbols there on 136, you know, not a plus, minus, asterisk, or slash. <coughs> Here on this file, it also allows for only uh, 50 elements in the string to be processed type of deal, so if there are too many characters over 50, then it uh, winds up with a stack overflow. Too many operands, you have operands left over, or you have not enough operators. So there's some assumptions it talks about, uh, errors there on uh, 136. It also has a very good discussion about no division by zero has a maximum of 50, 50 operands. It creates a class called postfix exception. So, as I say, you have some things there. And then you get here on 137, where it's actually taking you through the lines of code, where you have, uh, takes a string argument, returns a result, type of deal using the scanner function, has a integer value, the string operator, as say holes, the stack of integer. As I say, errors lines are protected uh, when dealing with the stack by if statements. I say it's allowing for empty stacks or full stacks type of deal. And so I brought that code in here on 137 and 138 and 139. And all of those are in the Chapter 2 uh, apps. I mean, Chapter 2 postfix is what the code there under the book files is called. CH02 postfix. There is 137. And then we get on over a little bit further. And we get into uh, how it works a little bit. Things like that. So you look there. Initial code. And as I say, it comes in here on to allows for only 50 characters type of deal, uh, where it says bounded of integer um, 50 right there on the bottom of 137. So it's setting up an array as such, bounded stack, integer of 50. And then we get on down, it initializes, it's taking the value with this tokenizer value of tokenizer of next int, so just does a conversion there, string to integer, into value, and then it put tries to push it down there. But notice if the stack is full, then it throws an except, an extension, too many, uh, an exception, excuse me, too many operands, stack overflow. Um, otherwise, it pushes the stack the value and then eventually, as it goes along, it next looks to see if there's a symbol. If there's a symbol, if it's not, remember the exclamation mark means not. Operator equals division or multiplication or plus or minus. Then it throws an illegal symbol, symbol error. Then it says, okay, obtain the second operand. So it makes sure the stack isn't empty. And if there's not enough operands, then it throws a postfix exemption there on the middle of 138. Then it obtains the first operand, make sure we don't have an empty stack. 
then it performs the operation and notice to do the operation all you have there on the bottom of 138 top of 139 is just saying operand one operator operand two and it makes that into the result and then once it goes through those four possibilities, remember it's checked already to make sure it's a legal operation, then it pushes the result onto the stack. And it just continues until it finds the final value in the string that it's re reading in. And then once it finds the end, then it pulls the last op, pulls result off and prints the final value. And so it get the very end says, if stack is not empty, if it is, then it says not enough operators. If it else it isn't, it pulls, resi pulls result from the stack top and pops it off there. So then it says, okay, we've reached the last operand. We pull the last value off the bottom of the stack as such. Then if, it's, if we get an empty, that's great. If we find that there's still something out there, then we are made, we don't have enough operands, and so we get stack underflow, and so we get our things there, and the program finishes. And uh, but then you get the CLI class for it, and as I would say that CLI is a command level interface, and as we've talked about the CLI. Um, you've really got to know a little bit more because you're keying this text into it or this string into it and if you don't know what it's doing then you got to know then you got to work with it a little bit there but it goes through scans until you user enters an X for the string obviously so you use the code C802 postfix to evaluate and so here you've got about 50 60 lines of code what we basically have talked about but you have to know what to enter there for it where you enter like the 5 7 plus 6 2 minus asterisk it gives a result and it gives another example there of 4 2 3 5 1 minus plus asterisk plus asterisk and there are not enough operands to work it. And then you also then see where it does have in the command X to stop, you enter a X. So you have sample runs there on 142. Then you get over here to 141, and there's a whole nother program out there um, called PFXI. Uh, GUI.java that is out under the C802 apps folder subdirectory and so that is actually expanding upon that with the idea of a graphical user interface and so you know it, even let's say since I'm learning all of this you know Java and how it deals with um, commands um, kind of just reading through the code to see what it do but it finally gets here on my notes here on page 26 where they say result equals postfix evaluate dot evaluate expression text get text well that's then where it brings it into the expression text from where the person has entered it in then they set the result they're looking for errors on it and so you have those beginnings and ends. <clears throat> now, of course, remember here in Java where you have a open brace and a closed brace. In a lot of your earlier languages, those open and closed braces are the same, of course, as a begin and an end. So if you always keep that in mind when you're working with code. So many of the modern languages, as I say, whether it's... Uh, here with the braces or brackets in some cases, there's normally for a block of code, structured programming, a way of defining where a block of code begins and ends, and certainly doing some indentations, all that of the code makes some sense. 
but you have as you work your way on down as a display frame where it shows what it looks like as the user to give a value then once it does that it comes in and waits for them to hit the appropriate values and so just you know it's always good even if we're not writing this code by hand but are bringing it in which is already pre-written and I'm certainly in favor of that because you'd never start off writing code in general by yourself you know there's always something you build from and so certainly not ha having the book um, programs available to work with to run and I want y'all to spend some time running these programs so you know take here the program that we just talked about here on Postfix. Take this program, their CHO2 Postfix. Download it. You know what you got it there. Download it and run it to see how it works. Or come on over and run the CLI version of it to, you know, uh, the command line. Or come in and run it with the GUI type of deal. And so really the last thing the book gets into, so run those two uh, under the apps. But it talks a little bit here at the very end about stack variation, alternate approaches. Remember, stacks are generic. You could redefine it instead as a class object. Talks a little bit how in normal data structures you have push and pop. I say the book here, the authors add that top operation where you can just look at or see the top item. I say you, it talks about how you could have implemented the top by a classic pop followed by a push. And the book talks a little bit about uh, checking for overflows and underflows. Um, some others would just say it's a precondition of the program. It would ignore. But I really like... Where the, where the authors of the book are building into things to check for to make sure that it's a valid entry, whatever, not just relying on the program compiler to be able to find errors, but they're handling it themselves, uh, using, as they talk a little bit here, about a Boolean value, a pop or push or top, if successful, true, if unsuccessful. Um, it gets into a little bit here of some new versions or new items. And so they talk about here this stack class is now supplanted by the DeQ class, bottom of 143. So certainly, you know, Java is slowly evolving or otherwise library name differences. Gets a little bit, just mentions here, collections framework. And we'll be talking a little bit more about collections for towards the end. And you get over to 145 just here with a summary. And it also talks about the UML uh, here on 146 for the stacks and all that. But as I say, we'll come up with some assignments and otherwise. But I'll get this lecture published I'll, out here for you. And y'all keep doing, I say, it's very interesting what I have seen some of y'all do on the homework, especially in looking at the uh, Turing Award winners from uh, the ACM. Several of y'all, excuse me, have mentioned that uh, you weren't aware of these areas of computer science, particularly graphics, gaming, all of those things and that's why I wanted y'all to spend some time because computer science has got so many different areas <clears throat> and there used to be a uh, and it's still there uh, a special interest group in ACM called SIGGRAPH and a lot of the early graphics development even though what y'all would call today would look at them you know and all that is yeah but you know you look at the displays the processors and all that but a lot of the ideas of raster pixel graphics all of those things came out of the ACM SIG graph so granted a lot of stuff they talk about um, 
is kind of, we'll say, highbrow or very, 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 uh, you know, academic. There's still so much development. So as I say, as you continue progressing through, most of y'all still have another year or so. You're still looking at really, well, what do I want to specialize in? Go out and look there under ACM and some of their things and learn more about your particular area of interest. But I'll get this lecture posted out to Moodle. I'll get the code for the text published. I'll put the Sinancon article. So y'all do that. Keep working on the assignments and call me if you got any questions. But have a great week. We will have you another lecture before long.